So welcome everybody to uh, today's webinar. So we've got myself, Andrew Taylor and uh, Dave Camlet. So today we're going to be talking through uh, realities of restarting swimming lessons in the UK. So we know that um, a lot of you have got uh, questions about the guidance that have come out and the purpose of today is to try and give as much clarity as we can um, regarding the guidance that's uh, currently available. I think from the offset, we're not going to be able to answer every single question. Some of the questions that you may have, um, we don't have any clear guidance from the government. Um, and again, a lot of what we're going to talk through today, we'll look at sort of the position that we're at currently and sort of give advice based upon what we think is sort of best practice and also looking at um, sort of how it could work for each individual swim school, whether that's in a leisure centre or um, in a, a, a smaller sort of private uh, swim school setting. David, I don't know if you want to add anything else to that. Um, not at the moment, no, carry on. <laughs> okay, next slide, please, Brett. So for those that have not joined one of the STA webinars um, before, uh, just to make you aware, we are recording this. Um, you can um, hopefully see the presentation that's on the screen. You don't require a webcam or a mic. If you have got any questions, there is a question section on your GoToMeeting control panel. So if you open up the questions section, you can type that in and we've got Rav, who's uh, sitting at the STA head office, who'll be able to answer some of those. We are gonna be taking notes and about halfway point through the webinar, we will uh, go through some of the key questions, some of the common ones that are coming through. And we'll also have quite a bit of a section at the end to, to answer as many questions as we possibly can. You will get um, a, a copy of the recording and a copy of the presentation, which will go to your STA online account. Um, and again, like we said, we'll try and answer as many questions as we can, but in reality, we won't be able to get through all of them. Next slide, please. So what are we going to be discussing today? Um, both me and Dave have had a, a lot of conversations about what, what we should talk about today. And again, we've tried to sort of narrow it down into to sort of three sort of areas. The, the first one is sort of looking at the considerations to, to restarting lessons, looking at the information that STA have, have provided and also the swimming and guidance that, that, that came out on, on Monday. On top of that, um, I want to have a bit of discussion around PPE and there's been a lot of sort of um, comments on the Swim Teacher Network around what sort of PPE may be, be able to be used. And again, I want to sort of clarify um, some of the positions on that. And the, the second part, I want to look at sort of the dilemma between when is the right time to start and, and looking at sort of the viability element of, of any swim school restarting lessons. We're then going to spend quite a bit of time looking at different examples of, of how lessons could restart. We've got some of the Swim England diagrams um, that were posted on Monday to talk through. And as you can see on the whiteboard behind me, I've been very busy uh, at making sort of some, some different versions, looking at a smaller teaching pool and how that might work. Because again, I, I recognize the 25 meter pools aren't always going to be applicable for, for everybody that's, that's listening today. We are then finally going to sort of look at the, the positive side, looking at opportunities. Although a lot of today is going to maybe come across quite negative, because again, that's the position we're in. We're in. It's, it's not ideal anything we're having to do. But we're going to look at sort of well, what can any swim school and business do to sort of uh, adapt their operations to to best suit the the difficult environment that we're in at the moment. And again, we'll look at training and support that STA can offer. And again, that that Q and A opportunity. Next slide, please. Over to Dave. Thank you. Good morning, all. Um, okay, so I think first of all, before I move on to this slide, I'm just going to put something out there that, that people have been discussing. It's been quite a hot topic on social media over the last couple of days, and I get it completely. Um, and I think now's my opportunity to be honest with you as much as I possibly can. Um, a lot of people are saying, why have we got all these different guidance documents? Why isn't there one document? Why didn't everybody work together? Um, we are working closely with the RLSS. As you've probably seen, we've shared their documents and said, there's no point us reinventing the wheel. They're the biggest player in terms of lifeguarding and life saving. So we recommend that people follow that guidance. We were involved. We've been allowed to see that previous before it went out. Um, so we were quite happy to share that. Um, I asked Swim England a good two or three months ago when all this first started happening, if we could collaborate, work together to avoid any confusion in the industry and try and come up with a, a key document that everybody could follow, regardless of which, you know, whether they're STA, it's Swim England or whatever. Um, and the answer to that was no. 
they didn't want to collaborate on it um so we tried they didn't want to what we did do is we said in the interim period then because i was getting an awful lot of questions about guidance um and when i say an awful lot i was i was receiving about 200 messages a day for about three weeks with people saying can you please give us some guidance so we put the guidance document out that we did um and that was an interim measure um we did then get sent the swim england documents for comments um and we did give feedback and some of that feedback was taken on some of it wasn't obviously um and people are saying well why weren't you credited on it the answer is i don't know in all honesty we did comment on it we were given feedback well, we were given feedback on it um why we weren't on it i'm not sure so it's a question for someone else i'm afraid so that's that out of the way um so moving on to the slide that you can see on the screen um we've got some core issues and andrew and i have tried to try to sort of wheedle out what the main issues are that people are going to find um clearly it's an uncertain time for everybody we've got a huge amount of potential risk with reopening of lessons and reopening of pools um listening to the government certainly they'll they'll make out to us quite clearly that risk although it's something we've dealt with forever we've always had to deal with risk a lot of us in swimming pools have dealt with a lot more risk than others um the risks at the moment are seemingly much greater because of that we've now got to try and work out how we reopen but have a balance which is why we have scales to have a balance between creating a safe environment but also actually being a profitable business and being able to reopen clearly we're not going back to normal anytime soon Government say this all the time. Patrick Valance on the TV is always saying this. Um, it, it, to their mind, we're about halfway through the pandemic, which means we're probably going to be dealing with these issues for quite some time. So what we're going to be talking about today within all of this is we're going to look at the COVID secure workplace and how we can do that and what we can do. So ability to create a COVID secure workplace, understanding responsibility. This is something that I keep I keep being asked. People are saying to me, I hire a school pool or I hire a hotel pool. Who's responsible for the cleaning? Who's responsible for the risk assessments? The answer is potentially both of you, but it does depend what's in your hire agreements so and your contracts. So that's something we'll discuss later. Practicalities of creating it and how you create the COVID secure workplace. A lot of guidance is on the government website, but a lot of it is very difficult to work out because there's bits everywhere um revised policies and risk assessments that's something that's a huge issue obviously it means people are going to have to start looking at how they revise their policies in order to make it covid secure and to protect themselves further down the line and risk assessments is a huge issue because clearly everybody is going to have to have covid risk assessments um that's something that we will be helping you with we will be giving you the swim school specific risk assessment guidance um, and we're working with various organisations that specialise in that. So hopefully we'll be able to help you with that pretty soon. Uh, review of which lessons we'll be able to restart. Andrew's going to talk quite a lot about this. Um, it may be that you can work it, depending on your pool type, that you can restart everything just on a slightly smaller scale. It may be that there's some bits that you just can't do yet. So we're going to talk about that um, and also staff training. So clearly staff training is going to be a big issue. By law, you have to do it. Um, and by law, you have to have done it with your staff returning to work for in a COVID situation. So we'll be talking about that as well. You've got to balance that with viability. So customer demand, is it there? What is the customer demand? And we can talk a bit about that in terms of the Leisure Net um, survey that went out recently. We shared it, Swim England shared it, everybody shared it to try and get as many swim schools to respond as possible. We have to date had, well, we haven't, but LeisureNet have had 47,000 just over uh, respondents to that, which is a good number. Not as many as I was hoping, but it's a good number. So it gives us a fairly good idea of what people are thinking. And we'll talk about that as well. Um, and just to throw it out there, LeisureNet, that was the survey was carried out and written by David Monkhouse, just because I should say that. Um, are we going to, we're going to talk about reduced lesson capacities. What does it mean? Do we have to reduce them? And if so, by how many? Operational and staffing costs, additional costs to create a COVID secure workplace and pricing. Are you going to keep the same pricing? Are you going to have to amend it? And we've got a bit of, bit of a response from that, um, from the LegendNet survey as well. So we are, we are aware of what the majority of parents are saying 
um, and we'll be talking about that in a bit. Um, next slide, please, Brett. Thank you. So, uh, COVID secure swimming pools, key messages from the documents that, that we have put out, the RSS have put out, Swim England have put out, um, the real key messages. Swimming pools are safe to operate, according to the guidelines, where free chlorine is a minimum of 1.5. Okay, and pH should be 7 to 7.4. You've seen that in the Swim England guidance. Um, that's something that I know there's a lot of talk about. Adam, who I know is on the call, Mr. Comfort, um, he's been querying that figure. Um, I have also been querying that figure. Um, but at the moment, that's that's the best figure that we have. That's what they're saying will or should should kill COVID. But there is no actual scientific evidence, as far as I'm aware, right now, um, that has been carried out and given us a full result on COVID-19. But based on everything that the scientists know on every other type of disease like this or every other type of virus like this, it should be that 1.5 is more than enough to kill it. Um, all businesses are going to have a responsibility to ensure they create a COVID secure environment and workplace for their staff and their customers. OK, and that's going to be a key balance to work out. It's not just about saying to your customers, yeah, everything's safe. It's also ensuring your staff are happy because if they're not, you've got all sorts of issues. Um, and it must all link to the relevant government guidance for each country. So as much as it sounds like a bit of a get out from all of the awarding organisations and NGBs and everyone else, we can only be guided by what the government say. It's not us that are saying swimming pools can or can't open or when they can or can't. The government have said to all bodies, basically, that are in any sport or any 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 industry, really, they're saying, how can you do this? How can you make this safer? Um, and all we can do is tell them what we can do. And then we have to wait for them to tell us what the outcome is. Um, it's also important to note that both the STA and Swim England and RLSS and all the others are issued as guidance only. They're not the law. They're based on the government guidance and the law, but they're not the law in themselves. It's up to each operator, each swim school, each owner to assess your facilities, your own facilities, and ensure that you're abided by the government guidance. Obviously, if you follow any of our guidance documents, those are kept up to date all the time and they follow the latest government's guide, government guidance. So you don't have to work out what it is. We're telling you what it is. Um, but you do need to keep track of what's going on. Um, and hopefully then we'll all be able to open safely. I think it's also important, the final bit, we're all in unknown territory. This is not something that the STA or from England or anyone else just instantly has the answers to, the same as the government don't. We've never been through this before. We need to approach it with caution because if we do reopen too early and things go wrong, I can imagine that the very next thing that's going to happen is we're not going to be allowed to be open and they're going to close us down again. So we need to make sure that we do it incrementally and we make sure that we lead it and do it safely or as safely as we possibly can. There's always going to be risk, but there's risk to everything. OK, thank you. Andrew, it's you now. It is. Uh, Brett, next slide, please. So something I want to look at is um, I'm sure we've all had the wonderful experience of going to supermarkets or those that may have uh, ventured to the shops. Um, this week uh, to join the, the mammoth queues at Primark or, or et cetera. What I could do on the um, question section, you can type in your answers. This. We just want to see sort of what people's responses are, is that, again, we haven't um, be, been having to operate in a COVID environment like the supermarkets have. And again, use the personal example of uh, my first experience going to Aldi when, we're, when the supermarkets changed and it was awful compared to Tesco, I felt much safer. Again, that changed my entire shopping sort of experience from always going to Aldi to Tesco because I felt safe and secure because of the measures they'd put in place. Again, I think it's it's good for us to look at other industries and, and look at well, what have they done to create a COVID secure shopping experience. Now, I know it's very different. They don't have water, they don't have a pool, they don't have kids, but equally, there's a lot of good things and bad things that, that, that those guys have, have done. So it'd be just interesting to see what um, people think in terms of the uh, the things that people have done well um, so far. So if you can add those onto the, 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 the question section, we can see some of the, the responses coming in. Um, again, David, I don't know if you've had any positives or, or bad experiences that we could just briefly touch upon 
um, as people are starting to, to put things in? Uh, to be honest, mo most of my experiences, not that I've been to many shops, I haven't been to any since Monday when they reopened, but certainly from, from supermarkets and my local Tesco Express down the road, I think they have pretty much got it right from the word go. Um, they, I spoke to some of the staff, I know one of the managers down the local one, and he, and he was saying to me that, you know, the same thing that swimming teachers are saying and, and swim school owners are saying, we didn't want to be in this position. We don't want to have to post someone out to handle a queue that's going to get shouted at all the time. We don't want to have to clean the baskets, clean the handles, clean the trolleys. Um, we don't want to have to have markers and everyone sitting behind shields, but it's a necessity for opening the business. And I think they've, to be honest, I think they've done a pretty good job of it. I know yeah, certainly with some, some, of the, some of the learning experiences, I think, came more from not necessarily the supermarkets, but from the sort of, um, without naming them, the, the DIY stores. I think they were the ones that had some more issues because I don't think they were quite as ready to open as supermarkets were. Yeah, exactly. And, and just seen on here, I think a lot of what people are putting on is sort of the one way systems that they've created, that the cleaning regime and, and again, visibly cleaner when you're going into the, the supermarket. Um, somebody put on here again about hand washing stations. It's all of these things. And again, clear labeling of, of sort of, again, don't pick something up if, you, if you're not going to buy it sort of thing. Um, again i think it's it's all these things that we can start to consider you you've all had that experience and no matter what size of swim school operator you are those are sort of things that hopefully you've started to think through in terms of well what could i learn from that those those other businesses that have, that have worked and how can i start maybe adapting that to how i've got to operate as, as a swim school business so brett if you could go to the next slide please uh -huh. okay so a summary of the guidance then, let's, let's talk through in a little bit more detail about the summaries. Um, the overwhelming thing, I mean, we put this in a good few weeks ago now, and I think it's sort of become the norm across all of the guidance that I've seen. Um, in fact, I've, not just in our industry, but everyone seems to be doing the same, that it's, it's a really good idea to have a dedicated officer responsible for COVID-19. Um, whether whatever you call them is irrelevant, there needs to be somebody that's in charge of that. And that person could be the one that oversees the safety of the staff, the safety of customers, the safety of you know, ensuring the cleaning's done. Somebody that has done training, and there's nothing stipulated by the government on what training, but in our document, obviously in our guidance document, we gave you a few links to some training on COVID specifically. Um, and one that I would recommend personally was the Starfish one, which although, although it's American, um, it's our partners in America, Starfish Aquatics, it, they actually have an aquatic specific section on it. So I thought it was quite useful. Um, so I would strongly recommend and urge that you all make sure that somebody is designated as a responsible person. Uh, capacity of classes need to be determined by various different bits. Social distancing, the meter square that's available of water space, the amount of poolside space that you've got because not everyone's going to be in the water all the time and i think a lot of people are forgetting that point um it needs to be linked to your risk assessments it needs to be linked to the ability it needs to be linked to the transitory period so how long are people in front of each other or next to each other if they're just moving past each other then it's not such an issue the government did a statement not very long ago on the tv saying that what they were concerned about was that people were walking along paths towards each other outside and somebody it was like a you know nobody knew quite what to do so one person stepped out into the road to try and stay two meters away from the person walking past them and they were saying the scientific advisors and the medical advisors were saying please don't step onto the road because that's riskier than the chance of getting covid walking past them and i think it's safe to assume that we can say the same with swimming if they're moving past each other in opposite directions and they're only there's only limited contact and limited time then you can take that into account um you can see from our diagram there that we've done um some helpful little diagram or helpful little circles which is the swimmer in the middle and we're basically saying if you've got a radius of one meter between you or all around you um, and then you've got the next one that they have a radius of one meter as well between them and your, your one meter radius so those two circles together um, that should give you a rough idea of how many you can fit in the pool. Now, of course, that's if everyone's standing still. As soon as they start moving, this all changes. But as I was talking to Andrew about earlier on this morning, 
one of the things that people need to bear in mind is whilst you can work out the maximum number in your pool, that's great. What does it mean? Is everyone going to be in the pool at all times? If you've got people, you know, if you've got two people swimming across and getting out, as long as they're socially distanced out on the other side, then you've got the next two getting in, they've got loads of space. So there's all sorts of ways of doing it. It's not just the physical number that you can fit maximum as a maximum in the pool. So do consider that. Um, a big contentious issue is teachers should deliver from poolside. Now, there's two different ways of looking at this, I think. The, we have said we recommend that teachers would, should consider teaching from the poolside. Swim England have said teachers should teach from the poolside. Now, Andrew will discuss this in quite a lot of depth, I think, later on, but bear in mind the word should, in terms of law and in terms of health and safety rules, um, should means that it's a recommendation, it's not mandatory. Um, but from both of our points of view, clearly, from a COVID perspective only, teaching from the poolside is safer because you can maintain social distancing easier. I get that it causes other issues later on with safety of the child and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But from a pure COVID perspective, teaching from the poolside is clearly the safest option to start with. You will then need to look at your risk assessments and work out if that's appropriate for the abilities that you've got. And Andrew, I won't go into it because Andrew's going to go into it quite a lot later on. Um, teachers need to be able to adhere to government guidance on social distancing. So between the staff themselves, between the teachers on poolside themselves. Um, and you'll have seen, certainly in the Swim England one, we haven't put it in, but Swim England have put in that they would like people to try and maintain one teaching station throughout the duration of their shift. So you've got to consider whether that works for you, if that's easier. I'm not entirely sure from a personal perspective that that makes a lot of difference. If you can maintain social distancing on poolside anyway, and they can, you've got a big poolside and they can get around each other with, and stay two metres apart, I don't really see the reason for staying in one place. Um, but that's something for you to consider as well. Evaluate the number of personnel on poolside. So have you got lots of people on poolside? Have you got not just staff but also customers so the next bit obviously is only one parent or carer should be with people or with the pupil i think that's a standard thing that everyone's put in because clearly we want to limit the number of people in the building because the more people in the building the greater the risk to everybody the more touch points there are etc cetera, etc cetera. um next slide please brett so Continuing the summary, uh, review available pool space to allow for correct social distancing, include entry and exit points. So again, I won't steal Andrew's thunder because he's got some lovely diagrams that he's drawn up that you can see behind him, but it's something to consider. Do we, do we have one entry point to the building, one exit point to the building, one entry point to the pool, one exit point from the pool? Are they gonna use the steps? If they do, how do you maintain cleanliness of that? How do you maintain social distancing when they're getting in and out? So something certainly to consider, but it's very difficult for us to give you a guide on that because it entirely depends on your poll, as actually, to be fair, a lot of this does. Allow so, uh, sufficient time between lessons for cleaning and to reduce the chance of clustering. So there's all sorts of different options of this. Again, it's not, not overly easy to give a definitive answer on. Sufficient time between lessons for cleaning. It depends what you're cleaning and it depends what you need to clean and it depends what other measures you put in place. So if they're coming in beach ready and they're leaving in their costumes with a toweling robe, then you're not going to need an awful lot of time to clean because you can now dip your equipment in the water and that should suffice to clean the equipment. If you've got lots of touch points, then you're going to need time to clean those in between. So are you going to stagger the classes? Are you going to shorten the classes? to give you five or 10 minutes in between. How long is that cleaning gonna take? You would need to test that. So you can't just reopen on the first day and say, oh, I'll, I'll leave two minutes to clean that, and then it takes 10. So you're gonna need to have an operational plan in place for how you're gonna do that. The, the cleanliness of the equipment number nine is something that I had challenged quite a lot um, with various different bodies, because everybody talked about, you must clean the equipment. And I said, if we're, if we're assuming that, that chlorine is killing or likely to kill the virus, are we assuming that any equipment in the pool is therefore sanitised and clean and ready? 
Um, and to be fair, Swim England have been to Public Health England and they've come back with that answer. So that's fantastic as far as I'm concerned. The easy way to do it is to dip it in the water. Uh, where possible, participants should bring their own equipment. I mean, that makes the cleaning even easier because they bring their own, they take it away. There's an argument to say, well, when they bring their own equipment, who's touched it outside? You know, have they been using it in paddling pools with their friends or whatever? Um, but again, when they come in, dip it in the pool, in theory, that is then cleaned. The equipment that can't be sanitised in the pool needs to be appropriately cleaned between the activities, including all the high traffic areas, change of facilities, handrails, towel hooks, lockers, doors, push handles on doors, all of those bits that people are going to touch are going to need to be cleaned. So it could take longer than you think. And we've already said, but where possible, teachers should remain in the same teaching station for the duration of the shift and aim to use the same equipment. OK, so those are key bits from the guidance documents so far. Next slide, please, Brett. So COVID secure workplaces and businesses, operational factors. Um, again, I've just talked about this, but things that you really need to think about, it's not just the enhanced cleaning schedule itself. So the touch points, the toilets, the changing rooms, equipment, et cetera, et cetera. But who, who is responsible for it? That is really, really, really important. A lot of people are saying to me, I don't have to worry about that because it's a school pool that I hire. Well, you do if the school people aren't there or the caretaker isn't there or whoever it is that's supposed to be looking after it isn't there to clean it. So I would imagine that they will want you as part of the hire agreement to agree that you're going to clean it. I imagine they'll want to see copies of all of your operational procedures, your risk assessments and your cleaning schedules. Um, and I would strongly suggest that when you clean it, you keep a record that it's being cleaned much the same as the old leisure centre days back in the old days when I was there. And we had a thing on the wall that said these changing rooms were cleaned at this time by blah, blah. I would suggest that you have something that shows that it was cleaned rather than just say, I'm going to clean it every half an hour and then you've got no record. Lifeguarding and first aid is obviously an issue. It's not something we're going to go into massively here because the RLSS have got a great document on it. Um, they explain everything in terms of how to do it, what lifeguards should do, what rescuers should do, and how you deliver first aid. They've obviously liaised with the European Resuscitation Council, et cetera, et cetera. So we won't go too much into that. Um, PPE, signage and hand sanitising points. Certainly, I've seen a thread this morning where a lot of people are talking about hand sanitisation and what, where do they buy this and where do they buy that? And people are buying things, Milton from Amazon and various other bits. There's, there's an awful lot coming up about that, um, particularly around the PPE bit, but just be aware that the signage, as in the one-way routes or the markers on the floor, all that kind of stuff will need to be in place. And it's not cheap. I'm aware of a swimming pool um, that has already bought all of their stuff and just the signage alone cost them 2,000 pounds. Now, I'm sure you can make your own, but that's, they wanted some professionally done stuff and it cost them 2,000 pounds. And they haven't opened yet so obviously it's a big outlay if you're going to do that but it, I, I think that's probably for most swim schools that's probably excessive you just need to make up some signs to say this is where we're going to go I would also strongly 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 suggest that you do some kind of walkthrough video which you can do on your phone um, which can be sent to the customers but also you could do one for your staff as well to say this is where we're going to do this this is how we're going to do that um, but one for, your, one for your customers that you could send to them to say, this is how you're going to, you know, this is where you're going to park. This is how you're going to enter the building. These are the touch points to be aware of. This is where you're going to sanitise your hands. This is where you're going to leave your, your bag. This is where you're going to leave your towel. All those sort of bits. Um, because I think if you can do that and you can also do something for the children that shows them what the new normal is going to look like, the parents can sit at home and explain it to them. So it's not all new on the first day that they come in. I'm, I, I'm a big fan of that. There's a few people that have done it already and a lot of other countries have had swim schools doing it and it seems to work really well. Maintaining social distancing, we've already said, obviously create one-way systems, ensure that you can get in and out of the building or not you, but they can get in and out of the building safely and just ensure that everything is, everything is clear and that you're not gonna get a massive group of people standing there going, I'm not sure where I'm supposed to go. And that's the one thing that probably you could learn from the supermarkets is that they tend to have a lovely flow in 
a flow through and a flow out of a completely different exit. There have been in some of the smaller ones, there have been quite a lot of bits where there's a queue waiting to go in and people have turned right and gone straight into the middle of the queue to try and walk past them. So that's again where you're gonna need somebody, your COVID officer to try and make sure that people know where they're going, particularly on the first week of lessons. And how are you gonna manage changing rooms? Obviously, it's a huge issue. It's something that there isn't an easy answer for because it entirely depends what your changing facility is like. Um, if you've got the cubicles, people can sit in the cubicle, people can get changed in a cubicle, it's fairly simple. They've got walls between them all the way around. If they're solid cubicles, then you haven't really got an issue other than the cleaning. But of course, as soon as they come through, you can send someone in to go and clean it. So there will be a cost implication there as well. But in terms of the, the turning up beach ready thing, I think it's a great idea to turn up beach ready if you can. So I'm not suggesting you turn up in your swimming costume and nothing else, but certainly a lot of children turn up in their onesie, don't they, with their costumes on underneath. That's great. I'm not a fan of them going home like that particularly. Um, and particularly, obviously, when you get to adult lessons or older children's lessons, they're very unlikely to want to pull a onesie over the top or a hoodie and just go home wet. So I think one of the things to consider is, can you get them to turn up beach ready, but then use the changing rooms to get changed to go home? So they're dry and clean to go home. And then how are you going to clean it in between? If everyone's turning up for the next class beach ready, it gives you plenty of time to clean it. Okay. Andrew, we're on to you and your PPE section. Yes. So next slide, please, Brett. Um, and Dave's answered that uh, question that's come up there in terms of uh, hiring, etc. Um, there's quite a few comments that were, were, were going on Swim City Network from Monday regarding, so again, whether we can be teaching in the water and whether the use of PP in the water would be a, a way of mitigating any risk of, of potentially a teacher or an assistant uh, potentially catching the virus. Now, all of this guidance um, I've got from sort of experts within um, sort of the health industry, um, one being my own dad, who, who uh, is currently look, looking at the, the, the way that um, GP surgeries that he looks after can actually ensure that um, they've got sort of sneeze proof sort of screens and, and the rest of the PPE. I think it's important just to run through in terms of what the current guidance from Public Health England is on PPE. Now, PPE is recommended where social distancing can't be maintained. So where at the moment we can't maintain that two meter distancing or where manual handling may occur. And, and this is where when we start looking at whether it's we feel it's appropriate to be in the water or not comes back to is that as soon as there's any element of manual handling. And again, the guidance is very specific to healthcare and education. There isn't any guidance for, for anything in sport regarding that kind of manual handling. Um, the level of PPE that would be required would be, as you can see on the diagrams, sort of the one that's highlighted in yellow, is that in schools or in sort of NHS or in care homes or, or nurseries, if there is any, any element of, of manual handling with a child or a patient, then there's a particular level of PPE that is required. Now, applying that same principle, if we were to be in the water or on pool side, we would, by the, the, the guidance that's been given by Public Health England, we would require that same level of PPE. It wouldn't necessarily just be appropriate to have a teacher with a visor on um, to, to ensure sort of mitigating that risk. PPE in, in this case, again, where social distancing can't be maintained and there is an element of manual handling taking place, it would be required to be changed or cleaned after any interaction with each individual pupil in our case and the correct donning and doffing procedure used. So again, the correct way of taking off the mask, the correct way of putting on the, 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 the PPE again. So again, it's all these things to consider if you are trying to look at, well, can I, uh, what level of PPE would I require? Again, if teachers on poor side and their social distancing, by from the guidance that's been currently given, they wouldn't need the same level of PPE because they're not in the same amount of risk. It's as soon as we're getting close than two meters or any manual handling is taking place. So in answer to some of the questions that are coming on regarding one-to-one -one disabilities and things like that, again, in reality, the, the stance is from the government that if any manual handling needs to take place, then PPE would be required. But the biggest problem for us is that PPE becomes redundant and ineffective as soon as it gets wet. It can't get wet. All of the, the guidance that I've been reading from Public Health England clearly states the procedures if, in uh, the case of healthcare or education, that PPE was to, to be compromised, it'd have to again be donned off um, and again replaced each time that they're interacting with another individual. 
I get that the idea of potentially having a face shield would potentially protect somebody to an initial degree, but face shields have been used as, as from a health point of view as a secondary measure on top of using a mask. Where we see them in supermarkets and again in shops where people might be wearing those, those clear visors, again, the idea is, is that somebody is social distancing or isn't necessarily having contact with somebody for longer than 15 minutes. And again, majority of us are all teaching for longer than 15 minutes. We've got 30 minute lessons. So again, all I'm trying to put out there is I'm not saying that um, it's, it's, it's just basically that is what the guidance is at the moment. And hopefully it gives a bit more clarity if you are looking at your risk assessments. Again, from all of this, for me, looking at, at where the safest place to teach is, it comes back to the safest place from a COVID point of view is poolside. Now I get that is not ideal for teaching uh, for non-summers, beginners. It's, it's not the preferred place I would want to teach with those uh, particular groups, or if I had somebody with a disability or, or with a one-to-one, -one. but in reality, that is the, the current situation in my personal view of, of from looking at the Public Health England guidance, what it's saying around PPE. I think what we've really got to consider is that the second to last point on the, on the slide is that the ultimate consequence of us getting this wrong is that COVID can still kill. Even though the death toll is coming down and yes, we're, we're all sort of coming to the point of, of lockdown measures being eased, as, as Dave said earlier, the scientists keep coming back to we're not coming to the end of this pandemic, we're halfway through and we don't want to get this wrong in that if something happened in a, in a leisure centre or a Sun school environment it would mean that actually all of us have to close again, then again, that's not going to be a good position for the whole industry. I really understand that, again, the, the whole debate of being in and out, it's, it's a very difficult one if, if, again, your pool means that actually it's not going to be possible to potentially teach on the side. I'll talk through a little bit later some alternatives and some, some adaptations, but that's a situation with PPE. Again, all the government guidance points towards we can't use PPE in the water. Therefore, if we're doing any manual handling in the water, we need relevant PPE coming around in that circle. The PPE is not going to work properly. Therefore, we're not going to be able to do any level of, of manual handling. When you look at the RLSS guidance regarding sort of if a rescue needs to be made, again, there's exceptions for, for when, it, when first aid or rescue needs to be made. But again, any first aid that's on poor side, the relevant PPE would need to be uh, applied. So again, it's just guidance there. It's, it's hopefully sort of um, will, will help people understand the process of you doing your own risk assessments and again from a viewpoint of, of working with GLL I'm very much I will not be wanting any of my teachers in the water we'll make a clear stance of, of teachers all teaching from poor side and we'll make the, the relevant adaptations uh, where we need to because at the end of the day I want to make sure that all of our teachers are safe and again as an employer that's your key responsibility make sure that all of your employees not just your teachers your assistants everybody needs to be in a COVID secure working environment so again, any other questions on that, please put them onto the, the question section and we can we can clarify anything else that comes up. Yeah, Next there's slide, a couple please, of points please. actually. Can I just jump in, Andrew? There's a, there's a couple of questions I've just been looking at while you're doing that. Um, people are saying, I teach at both, I'm an SDA teacher, but I teach at a Swim England school, blah, blah, blah. Um, which guidance you follow, in all honesty, is, is up to you. If you're an SDA teacher, you can follow SDA guidance. But you're going to be guided by the employer so if you're not the owner of the swim school then you need to obviously follow the rules that they put in place and they'll be responsible for putting these in place not you as a teacher if you're the swim school owner um, then you would follow whichever governing body it is that you work with or you can do a combination if you really want to it's ultimately and again it's not a get out but it's a fact it's your swim school you own it you run it it's for you to risk assess your swim school. We will give you as much help as we can, obviously, um, but we can't write your risk assessment for you. We can give you guidance on it, but we can't do it because that's your legal responsibility. Um, and I think, is there a law that says you can't teach in the water? No, there isn't. Is there a law that says you can't touch the children and manually support them? No, there isn't. Um, so could you argue that potentially and i'm not trying to put words in your mouth to make you think this but could you argue potentially that okay it's is the risk of covid greater than the risk of drowning if i've got a three-year-old without an adult in the water um and there's no assistant and the teacher's on the side and i've only got deep water to teach in 
is the risk of drowning of them or the risk of them getting difficulty in being scarred for life is is that greater than the risk of them getting COVID? Possibly. So what could you do to mitigate it? Could you use more equipment? Could you use, you know, swim fins, aquaplanes, turtle packs? Could you use things that physically strapped to a pupil? Um, I think we, we the one thing we have to be careful of, and I really, really urge you to be careful on, is a lot of people are just saying, well, I, I, don't, I don't agree that you should teach from the side. I don't agree with it. Therefore, I'm going to get in anyway. You can, because that's your decision. But if anything does go wrong, you are going to be liable if you haven't got decent risk assessments that prove that that was the more sensible way to do it. So please, please, please be really careful with how you do it. And as we said right at the beginning, do everything with an air of caution. So err on the side of caution rather than just go, I'm just going to do it. Um, and if you're going to do it, which nothing says you can't, just make sure that you've covered yourselves. OK, just the, the government. Sorry, Andrew, one more thing. The government is saying at the moment, you know, even in if there's quite a quite a key thing, obviously, they're talking about whether to lower the two meter social distancing. So it could well be that by the time pools reopen, that might be different anyway. So obviously, we'll reflect that in our guidance if that happens. But that could be different anyway. But I still very much doubt that they're going to say, you know, even if they reduce it from two meters to one meter, it might mean you can get more people in the pool. But it still doesn't mean that manual handling and support is is an ideal way to do it. But Patrick Valance, again, as the chief scientist chap on there or one of the chief ones, he was saying the other day, of course, if you've got um, a workplace and you cannot socially distance, then look at other mitigating factors. So he was talking about could people be back to back? Could they be side to side? They're concerned about the prolonged face to face contact. So are there other ways to manually support? Do they need manual support? So look at everything that you can think of and risk assess it. Andrew. Just to come on to some of the questions that are coming in. Again, the, the, the problem we've got is that everybody's saying, well, can we, if we support from behind or the side? But again, there isn't that clear guidance from government at the moment. Again, even if the social distance, like Dave said, was to go from two metres to one metre, the the guidance that we've only we can only work on in terms of manual handling is that that's been already given for the healthcare and education which again you can find on public health england uh, website again it's all on there it's, it's it, you do have to search for it you can find it we can hopefully get those links so that people can find that but again it's a lot of people are asking the question around well could you have a parent in and again i'm sort of referring to a bit like key stage one sort of uh, parent and child lessons so you kind of five to seven year olds we wouldn't normally ever think about having the parent in after maybe sort of the preschool age but is it a way of actually as an ad adaptation that within a social bubble of a, a household they can manage support their own child and again would it be easier to socially distance a bubble of two people um the, the adult and the child with a teacher on the side giving instructions some people are asking questions around qualifications Again, if you're a qualified uh, swimming teacher, either STA award or certificate or Swim England level two, again, it's an adaptation. See that parent as an assistant rather than it being an adult and child lesson. The, the parent in this instance will be the person who is just there to support. And again, we'll talk about in, in sort of the next slide if Brett can move us on to that. Um, we, that's that's the, the key thing that I think we need to, to be thinking about. Again, it just comes back to, from a risk assessment when we talk about teaching from the pool side we know it's not ideal but there's many things that every business have to do which isn't ideal but we're having to adapt because that's the guidance we've been given and and the situation that we're in manual handling again if we can put that back onto sort of the parent doing the manual handling if that's an appropriate alternative that you can you can allow within your swim school and again whether your space will allow that then I think that's probably the most suitable solution rather than putting an employee or yourself as a swimming teacher at risk. Because again, although at the moment they're saying what one in 1,700 people uh, are potentially infected, again, the, the risk between a, a child drowning and con contracting COVID, again, what's more likely to happen in a swimming pool environment, as Dave said, is, is that if they've not got support and they let go of the, the, the buoyancy aid, could there potentially be a higher risk of drowning? But again, we still have to manage that with the, well, what if that staff member were to contract um, COVID? What situation would you be in as, as an employer? 
thinking about again from a teaching point of view that we need to think about the, the teaching position around pool side so again just because the teacher's on pool side if a child is close to the edge they still need to be social distancing we can think about the distance between the pupil that is lower down and the teacher stood up but again things like kneeling down things like being closer to the summer we need to avoid all of that i've seen some of the questions around ppe for, for teachers on pool side again that's down to, to your own risk assessments in reality, teaching in a mask is, is not going to be ideal because, again, we're not going to be able to project our voice. We can use visual aids to, to try and make it uh, clear of what we're, we're trying to get across the pupils. But my personal view is that actually if we socially distance by that two metres, then the level of PPE that we require, we shouldn't need any PPE because, again, um, we're, we're ensuring that actually we're not coming into close contact with, with anybody in the water. However, if you feel the teachers aren't going to be able to socially distance by that amount, you may need to consider the level of PPE that you recommend. Again, things like gloves wouldn't necessarily be, be, be needed because we can constantly clean our hands in the pool because, again, that's going to kill anything that, that's potentially um, on our hands rather than having to maybe have a hand sanitising station. But things like uh, a mask and a visor on pool side, again, entirely down to you as a swim school, which I know maybe sound like a cop-out, but again, it is down to each individual business and based upon your premises to understand could you have an exclusion zone around pool side, which I'll, I'll demonstrate in a minute, or actually do you require that PPE instead? Dave's mentioned about cleaning of equipment. I think that's quite an easy one. If you if you are running sort of parent and child lessons, do consider if they're using any toys, again, is it that they could have anything that they put in the mouth. Again, we need to sanitize that, but again, the level of, of cleaning will depend upon the, the amount of equipment that you're potentially using. And again, um, how are we making sure could it be the kids are actually helping us clean the equipment at the end of the lesson rather than potentially our teachers doing it It becomes a bit of a game that again we're making sure that they're involved in the process and it might again help speed up the time it takes to 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 do the lessons again some kids we know won't potentially clean it they'll try and put the equipment in the mouth and eat it which won't help us in this cause but again it's just trying to think of ways to 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 help Thinking about social distance in the water, I've got friends who are uh, reception teachers. It's near and impossible in the classroom, so we know it's not always impossible in the pool. Kids will want to come close to each other, and it's about educating them about sort of uh, why it's important to social distance. Think about, again, the, the sort of games that you could create to teach them about social distancing. Pupils that have already gone back to school will have started to learn this, and again, it's just about that education process. Like Dave said, if you can give some of these as video resources beforehand and again talk about what lessons going to be like what's going to be different hopefully we can help them sort of get used to the new norm of, of whatever it looks like um, in, in your swimming pool um, organizational methods communication methods they're all going to, have to be adapted again the way we set kids off again we might not normally have children sat on the side and some swimming but that might be the way we have to have it to ensure that actually there's, there's the uh, there's a correct amount of distance between each pupil to ensure that again we're not um, having pupils potentially going within that two meter radius in reality kids are going to get close to each other it's just about trying to mitigate that risk as much as we can parents teachers and pupils are all going to be nervous coming back i think again i've not been on poor side uh, for, since the, the start of lockdown again I think the first time I go on I'm going to feel nervous and I've got to try and portray to my own staff across GLL when we get to, to reopen lessons that we, we, it's safe to do so so again I think it's anticipate that we need to build confidence and, and be honest with each other that again none of us have gone through this before therefore we might not get everything right but it's again working as a team is going to be so so crucial to getting it right and whether your team is two people three people ten people Again, your whole team of, of who's sort of making sure that they're, they're coming through the entrance point and the changing room management, the cleaning management, not just the, the, the teaching on its own is going to be so, so important. So again, it's, it's working together um, to ensure that everything works smoothly. Again, a bit like the supermarkets, you're coming in, you have that nice flow. In our case, you come in, you, you get changed, you have your lesson, you exit, and we keep that conveyor belt going to ensure that, again, it becomes viable for us as, as a business. Next slide, please, Brett. So, um, Rav, is there any questions that you've seen come in that have, have been quite a, a common trend that you want us to answer? Um, or Dave, is there any, be any that you've spotted that you want to uh, have a bit of a discussion about? 
Hi guys, uh, there's quite a few questions coming through at the moment, um, some that I've prioritised um, than others. So if I start from the top, uh, is there a time limit for dipping equipment in pool, like the 20 seconds washing hands? No, no, not that, not that, not that we're aware of. No, I mean this, this. I've seen a few questions on this pop up actually. The some people obviously missed the bit earlier. Um, so sanitisation of equipment in the pool is fine. The suggestion is you dip it in the pool. Um, the contact time that it should take for chlorine to kill it isn't known. That's the thing. It's not. It's not a proven science as far as I am aware but it is the guidance that Public Health England, SAGE and Swim England seem to think is okay. So that's a great result, I think. Um, several people have asked about if people are wearing back floats, can they then dip those in the pool? Yep. Any, anything that's pool equipment that can go in the pool without breaking it, um, you can dip in the pool and that will count as sanitization. In terms of handrails and all of those bits and pieces, the same argument can be applied to those. If you can apply pool water to it and bucket it all down with pool water, then the theory is that you've cleaned it. I think using the, the 20 second example is probably a good um, sort of rule of thumb. Again, it's there's no clear evidence from government, but you can say from a risk assessment point of view, well, the advice is we need to wash our hands for 20 seconds. Therefore, is it do we need to dip things in for 20 seconds? Again, if we can make that part of the, the kids doing that, and again, they're pushing it all the way under the water, it doesn't need to be that they're scrubbing it. It's just that it's it's been covered um with the mark chlorine but again that's that's still be to 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 be sort of decided as as dave said this it's, it's down to everybody to think what's best and what's reasonable um will probably be the advice that government would give thanks guys another question here has anyone advised particular chemicals to use which is safe within a pool environment for high traffic surfaces No, not that, not that I'm aware of. There is, PewTag have got a great document um, on their website, which we've linked to within our guidance, which talks about sanitisation. Um, so please do have a look at that. That's through the SGA guidance that we put out. Um, but a lot of people are, are talking about certain types of Milton um, that are supposedly proven to have killed co or to, to kill COVID. So I think all of the, all of the general things that you would think of, any kind of disinfectant, but just be aware that if you're chucking disinfectant all over everything on pool side, it may well affect your pool water balance. So you need to speak to whoever's in charge of the pool before you do these things. Thanks, Dave. Another one here. Uh, is there separate guidance for working with babies and toddlers, do you know? No, same, no. same, same rules apply. I mean, there is an interesting question that's popped up actually about that. Um, saying if a parent attends with a child, does the one metre circle need to uh, increase? No, it doesn't, mm. because they're from the same family unit, they're from the same bubble, and they're not having to socially distance from each other. So they can, they count, if it's a baby and a child, or if they count as one, basically, in terms of the distance around. Fab, thank you. Uh, one from Sue. Do you have any guidance or thoughts on the use of showers before and or after lessons? use them as much as possible um yeah i mean the recommendation certainly certainly from swim england's guidance is that people should be encouraged to shower before they come and should be encouraged to shower when they get home which i think is reasonable um but how many in reality are going to do it they're all going to nod and say they did it but did they um so i if, if you can have showers in your facility open and available to use and they're communal showers and they're walk, walk through ones or whatever you've got then i would strongly suggest that you get people to shower before and after if you can and if they can't do it because of your facility and the design of your facility or you've only got one shower because it's a school pool then you might be better closing it off completely and letting them do that at home i think it's just worth to point out on that one that um again all of it comes back to a shower on its own normal water wouldn't kill the virus it's, it's soap and water so again in reality would we then be expecting um all of our pupils before they get in to have a shower with soap and again it's it's thinking about that the changing room is is probably your, your limited space area and actually again like dave said if they could come beach ready but then the change room has been used for them to exit and and and, and uh, get changed but again it's how that shower area will be managed again about sort of the, the social distancing element but also about again would the shower area need to be cleaned 
uh, more regularly. So it's, it's all these things to consider, but equally it's, it's no different than it was pre-COVID. We'd always recommend for people to shower before and after going swimming, it's just best practice. But in reality, it's just the, the, the logistics of managing that. Um, again, where you've got lots of children and lots of parents, um, how do we ensure that they socially distance in a very small, tight area? Thanks, guys. Um, another question here. We are purely a hands-on business working exclusively with children with autism and other abilities. We hold hands for safety and around 80% of our children require constant assistance for safety. Are we better to continue to pause until we can fulfill services in a safer manner and to best effect? I, I would agree with that. Um, just on this, having um, talked talk this through with, with, with my boss, Andrew Clark, who's the, the, the national sports and um, aquatics manager for GLL, we're not looking to reopen lessons till September, so of our evening and weekend lessons. Again, this business, that's because we know we can support for the gyms opening and, and using the pools for kind of more low risk activities such as fitness swimming and for sort of looking to try and get swimming clubs back. And again, look at a phased approach of getting to that point. Again, if I was in that position of, of where actually my business is all related to manual handling, I'd be looking at, well, I'm a better waiting. It's also looking at if you've got individual disabilities, are they still going to have to be shielding? Because again, the risk to those individuals, not just to the, the staff that might be in the water, but the risk to actually that pupil might be greater. So again, it's understanding, well, is this the best time for me to restart lessons? That's an entirely personal and, and business decision. Some businesses will need to because you, you're wholly reliant upon swimming lessons to, 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 to fund um, and, and sort of ensure that you've got enough income coming in. But equally, there's, there's no point restarting lessons if you don't feel like you can be able to create that safe environment, both for your employees and for your customers, which I know, again, is not an ideal position to be in at all. Um, but that's the reality of, of the situation that, that we're currently in at the moment. Thanks, Andre. Um, another one here. If a child is in a bubble with another child at school, would they need to maintain social distancing during a swimming lesson? Um, based upon the current guidance, yes, because the bubbles are just related to the school environment rather than wider. Because again, in that instance, there's no guidance to say that out of school, this would still be applicable. Again, the guidance relating to an educational setting is specific for an educational setting. It can't then be said, oh, well, we'll, we'll adopt that because again, the current guidance from government regarding sort of households is that it's only for a, a single individual to be able to pick an individual sort of household or, or family to go to. Until that guidance changes, um, we still have to abide by that all pupils um, would still need to socially distance because again in that group unless every single pupil is from the exact same class that are all still within that bubble it would it, that's very rare for that potentially to happen and it, again we can't uh, adopt particular guidance for particular settings for our own we have to look at what the, the guidance is for our for our industry and and for the public um, wider it's also too important to remember on that, that even though they're in the bubble at school, they're still supposed to be trying to maintain social distancing as well. The government have obviously recognised that it's unlikely that children will, but they're still the school still has the same obligation that we do in that they're supposed to try to maintain social distancing. We all know it's not really going to happen with kids, but we've got to pretend somehow <laughs> that we, we're going to be able to do it and then sort of deal with it as and when it goes on. When I say pretend, I don't mean literally pretend. But we've, we've got to put our policies in place to show that this is how we're going to manage social distancing. The reality, when they then swim like that and go across each other, is going to be very different. Right. Um, we're working to hold fire on the rest of the questions till the end. Just to make everybody aware, we are going to run over. I think we predicted we were going to run over because we were meant to finish at 12, but we will keep going. If you do need to, 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 to leave because you've got other commitments, this has been recorded. So don't feel like um, if you're not able to stay on. Uh, you will be able to access it later but for everybody else we probably will go through to about half past 12 because we're, we're again we're only halfway through but i think it's important us to talk through this in in detail so that everybody feels again that they're, they're getting their questions answered brett next slide please so the viability sessions we talked a lot about the guidance and again we've only given an overview there's so much more you need to read it in, in depth and as dave said whether you pick with the sta or the swim england again 
pick the one which you think is relevant for, for you and your business. Um, there is a not a sort of right or wrong in any of this. It's just a case of, of whichever you feel suits suits your needs as a swim school. In terms of the viability, it's sort of the points on here is to sort of again, hopefully many of you as swim school owners will have thought about this, but again, it's just trying to put into a simple sort of structure of what are all the things I need to consider before actually I, I get to the point of reopening. And the first thing on there is what is your change room capacity? Everybody's jumped to what's my pool capacity? Irrelevant in some cases, because if you're changing rooms, you can maybe only accommodate five people in there whilst they're socially distancing, but your pool's got a capacity of 10. Well, how are you going to make sure that, the, that you can have 10 people getting changed and be able to come on pools at the same time? It's something that we looked at um, as a company when we started looking at how we do things differently. And it is probably the biggest crunch factor is that if you can't um, social distance in the changing rooms, so again, if you've not got cubicles, if it's sort of a, a, a an old school sort of bench layout, again, in that sort of bench layout, we're going to have to ensure social distancing takes place. And again, we can put the onus onto to the parent um, or the guardian, but in reality, how are we going to ensure that we can actually get people through? Dave's idea of, again, beach ready, again, coming and not maybe using the change rooms, it's, it's whatever you can do to increase that. Is there other areas of your buildings that you could use for, for actually getting the people changed. Again, if they're coming in the onesies or the tracksuits with their swimming costume or, or the trunks on already, could they just then sort of drop their stuff off into a box, come onto poolside, and again, they would only use the changing rooms and the showers for, for leaving the building. Second to that, once you know what your changing room capacity is, what is the total number of pupils you can teach within your, your pool? Every pool is gonna be different. And when we, we talked through some of the diagrams and some of the information from some England, Again, that all is determined by that, that social distance and again, making sure every summer um, is able to uh, keep that two meters um, uh, away from each other. The next one is to that is, well, how many staff are you gonna require? And the reason why I say staff is because, again, traditional sort of pre-lockdown, you may be just talking about teachers and assistants, maybe receptionists. And again, if you're a leisure center, it's gonna be much wider, but if you're, you're a, a small or medium-sized private swim school business, you may not have had that wider amount of, of cleaners or other staff members, but again, you might require less teachers to teach the number of pupils that are, are in, your, in, in that can be accommodated in the pool. But actually, are you then going to need people to ensure that who's going to be the COVID officer, who's going to be the ones that's responsible for, for the change rooms and the cleaning, who's going to be responsible for sort of the entry and exit points of the building? It's all these different roles that again it is going to be a cost. So. It might be that you've got staff members that are not teaching, but again, you're actually still using them uh, in a different role as an interim measure, which again, from a financial point of view, you need to look at, again, what sort of pay rates would those individuals be getting, which again, is entirely down to uh, your own business. On number four, in terms of the additional cost, Dave's already mentioned about the signage, but signage is just one part of it. Um, Again, if the government do change from two metres to one metre at, at some point, or even go to 1.5, we're all going to have to get new stickers and it's going to be a nightmare because everybody's bought all these two metre social distancing stickers. There's a big cost that, again, you've got to think about in terms of making sure that your whole um, pool environment and changing room environment is COVID secure. And again, don't underestimate that cost. And again, if that's a, a factor which determines whether you're ready to reopen when the government allows us to be, or whether you wait longer, again, that's something you need to take into account. With all of this, you get to number five, what's your margin going to be? Again, are you just going to be able to make enough by the number of swimmers that you've got in the water and the, the staffing costs and the additional costs to make a COVID secure environment? Is it going to be financially viable? Are you willing or able to make a loss for a particular amount of time? Again, we don't know if the government are going to uh, change the, the, the rule on social distancing. Again, even if they do, from, from our perspective, we're potentially looking at we could operate maybe 40, 50 percent capacity at two metres. Whereas if we're going to one metre, it's maybe it's between sort of 70 to 80 percent capacity. But again, what margins are you able to operate on is going to be a big factor to whether um, you are going to be open or not. The last point on there, which Dave's also picked up upon in terms of pricing. Um, we know from a health and fitness point of view that we're going to go into the biggest price war that we've ever seen. Kind of, you've got Pure Gym and all the other sort of gym operators versus sort of um, local authorities and, and trusts and uh, other operators that are going to be fighting for customers to come in. Is it that, again, from a swim school perspective, you're going to have to potentially charge more? And again, a customer's going to be willing to pay more. Or actually, do I need to lower my price? Because again, 
maybe not able to offer the same uh, sort of lesson experience that you previously were able to do so. Again, that's entirely down to you as, as, as a business owner in a swim school, but it's all these things to consider. It's not as simple as, right, I'm going to switch the lights back on, get back in the pool. There's so much more that we, we need to, to think about. Next slide, please, Brett. So hopefully on the poll, if uh, I let Brett take control, um, I've got a question here and there's no right or wrong and I'm not trying to lead anybody into a particular way of thinking, but it's, it's just something to consider. Again, the reason I'm saying July is because the, the, the sort of inc inclination from government is that sort of by the, the 4th, 6th of July, we will be able to reopen swimming pools or commercial swimming pools and, and leisure centres and, and gyms. So do you think July is the right time? Um, and again, I've just put on there, yes, no, or unsure. I'm just interested to see what people think um, from kind of the, the 500 odd people that we've, we've got on the, the webinar today. So already I'm seeing a, a, a very clear sort of, I thought it'd be more of a divide, but actually that's, that's interesting. As I've already said, um, GLL, who, who I work for, we've taken the decision not to start our lessons back to September, but that's again because as a business, we've got other areas that can bring in income. Um, although swim school is a huge um, amount of income that, that we would normally get, it's something that we've just taken decisions to take longer to ensure that we get it right and that we, we can prioritise um, sort of the more low risk activities first and then build it back. Potentially, again, we'll look at uh, the possibility of holiday sort of courses that we would normally do. But again, we need to look at how that would work and, and um, sort of the, the implications of doing that. So I think if you want to stop the poll now, so that's a really clear split. Um, we've got yes, 19%, no, 52%, 30 unsure. If I'm honest, I thought it'd be, it'd be more sort of 50-50, but that's, that's very interesting. I think, again, there's no right or wrong. Those that have said yes, completely understand it's, it's, the, it's your business. For those that are self-employed or have maybe not been able to get grants and things, it's a very difficult time. And I, I, I really do feel for all of you, you, you out there. As Dave's mentioned, the, the LeisureNet survey will give us a better understanding of what customers are thinking. But I think we can also sort of look at what else has been happening. You're all probably aware of sort of the, the uptake within England of, of sort of reception in year six pupils and the whole debacle of, of schools going back. and Again, when you look at the news stories at the time of when this was happening, you saw a very clear split of parents who were maybe not feeling comfortable to let their kids go back yet, whereas others were, were dying to sort of get them out the door. And again, I've not got kids myself, so I've not had to do any homeschooling. I'm sure a lot of you, it's, it's quite challenging at the moment and, and sort of everything's maybe on a knife edge of whether it's going to be a good day or, or a bad day. But again, we need to understand whether customers are happy to send, send them back. And again, if they've been sent to school and they're not having to potentially pay for that, if, if they're going to state schools and academies, we're asking customers to pay and potentially, again, would that be a factor that would mean that they're, they're not happy to come back? Some might be. And again, if you can work out the number of customers that can and you can still make it viable and you can still make sure you've got a COVID secure workplace and business, then, then by all means go for it. But again, I think, proceed with caution, make sure that you don't rush into anything that potentially means that you're putting anybody at, at risk. The dilemma at the just bottom... Jump in, Andrew, can I just jump in on the leisure net because it's interesting. Um, I've, I have some of the results from David Monkhouse and leisure net and I, I won't go through the whole lot because it's far too many, but the interesting bit is um, around about 50% of all of the people that um, responded, which bear in mind this is 47,000 parents have responded, about 50% of those have said that their children will restart lessons as soon as they possibly can, but 44% have said they will not come back before September. So it's not far off a 50-50 split. Yeah. Um, so which I, I must admit is the same as Andrew I thought was what we would find from this in the survey with the poll we've just done with you. So interesting, a lot of parents are saying, even if we can go back, we're not going back until September. It's 44% of them. Yeah, I'd play the positives though, is that again, 50% is a, a lot higher than I was potentially anticipating. Um, and again, if if you're only able to operate at 50% capacity and you can keep your costs lower, again, it could be, it could be a, an element of being able to get people back. Equally with all of this, you've got to think about the furlough scheme. The furlough scheme is going up till October. So again, in terms of protecting your employees, again, 
in terms of you, you might not be able to bring everybody back, but again, those employees will still be able to, to stay on that furlough scheme um, if they're eligible to do so. Again, it's a dilemma. There's there's no sort of, we can't give you any more sort of steer than we have done. But again, we're just trying to give you all the information so that you can make a, a, a clear business decision for, for yourself. Um, next slide, please, Brett. So, Brett, can you press the that cue? Oh, is it a jump to the last one? Brett, can you press enter again and see if another image comes up? I'll go back. Because it's three images. One more, please. Oh, back, back, back. <laughs> and one more. Oh, let's go to the first image, it's fine. I did have three images, guys, and it was the three images um, from the swimming and guidance. Um, all is to talk through what this looks like. So the first image on there, in terms of how we could operate, well, this is how sort of lane swimming is, is going to look in a, a leisure centre environment. Double lanes, capacity of 10 people per lane, logic being that if everybody swims five metres apart, then everybody can maintain that social distancing. From a lesson perspective, in reality, again, this would potentially work for our sort of more advanced swimmers that can already swim 25 metres. Uh, again, for a lot of businesses, that's not the, the bulk end of, of what you're dealing with. In terms of some of the key points of this, what I would recommend is thinking about sort of positions of when they all stop. My biggest worry is when I know if anybody's been lane swimming, we all don't stop at the same uh, time. Potentially, again, if we do, would we all be able to socially distance? Think about having sort of designated rest zones. So again, if you have a five meter area as a rest zone for your swimmers, and again, this could work for, for club swimmers as well. It would just mean that in this model, you'd be able to have four people stood socially distancing in a five meter flagged area. And then potentially other swimmers could swim around sort of a, a marker either on the lane rope or on pool side, or actually it could be something in the water at six meters. And that would ensure that again, you could continue that flow with, without people um, sort of all cramped up together um, wanting to get to the water bottle or things like that. In terms of your entry and exit points, again, you need to think about that that's if they say the pupils are potentially maybe swimming only, only one time. I would recommend in this model, keep as many pupils in the water as you can um, rather than getting them in and out. Because again, it, that becomes difficult from managing where your teachers are and your different teaching stations. Um, but as I'll come on to in some of my own diagrams is think about your exclusions around the pool side. If swimmers are moving, the, the social distancing rule doesn't have to necessarily apply. The same as walking past somebody. It's, it's more about when pupils are stood um, close to each other and are stationary. That's when the issue becomes, becomes more prevalent. Again, if you can have them standing sort of back to back or side to side, it's all about preventing those aerosol droplets, basically coughing or sort of spitting the water in this case that, that could potentially spread, spread the virus. Uh, next image, please, Brett. If it'll do it. Super. Um, so this is one of the diagrams in terms of more of a, a learn to swim environment. Again, it is a 25 metre pool. Um, I know from seeing a lot of the comments across sort of Facebook from uh, Swim England forums to the Swim Teacher Network. In this, it, the idea is that the swimmers are a place where they are so that they can socially distance and that in reality they would swim and cross. We know they don't swim in straight lines. In this model, there's no way on earth that the section two or three, the kids will, will end up swimming into each other. I don't see it being a practical way of getting the swimmers to, to move effectively and you as a teacher to be able to manage that. Again, I think there are more um, dynamic ways of, of using organisational methods, which I'll talk about in a second. But again, it's you need to think about what your pool looks like and, and again, how you can best manage that. So if Brett can go to my next slide. So hopefully everybody can see this. Um, I know it's on a whiteboard because um, we had a fun family evening of, of swimming teachers and people that are swimming geeks looking at how it would work for a teaching pool. Because I get that the guidance so far has been a 25 meter pool. Most of you aren't, aren't dealing with that. So what would it look like in an eight by 10 meter teaching pool? So the first thing to say is, um, so it's not to scale because um, it didn't quite work. But again, hopefully everybody can see where I'm coming from. If we look at option number one, so the first thing to say is that round the pool side is sort of the, the, the red lines is like a one meter exclusion zone. If you can manage that, if your pool side is wide enough, it means that, again, your teaching position could be a lot more dynamic. And that, again, you can ensure the teacher's always two meters away. So 
they wouldn't have to be um they, they could be to the side of a pupil so if you were to actually take where the t of the teaching zone is as a teaching position that would be effective enough to ensure that they're social distancing from the pupils in the water but option one is a is a more basic version of, of what some england produced of right if you had three summers on one side and two summers on the other so in this area it's a a a um eight meter by five meter um uh, a teaching teaching area you'd be able to have five pupils in there that, that could cross over and, and and swim past each other but in reality it's not going to work kids aren't going to do that it's not going to work with our sort of non-summers and beginners it's going to be very difficult to manage also you can only fit five summers in there it's not potentially going to be that viable but what if you've got them working in a circuit so with option number two all of the the purple dots represents a swimmer and all of the sort of orange squiggles that you can see are markers, a bit like musical chairs. The kids will stop and go to the closest marker that they've got. Again, it's something visual, it's something they, they can get used to. If they're in between something, again, like musical chairs, they've got to quickly get to the, the one that they're going to go to. Even on the lame rope, we discussed last night, you could even just tie a woggle or a noodle onto the lame rope as a marker, um, as a cheap way of sort of saying, well, that is where you could potentially stop. In this sort of method of sort of working in a circuit, you're sort of looking at a, a two meter social distancing zone, but also you need to think about sort of the buffer zone. So if we're lane swimming, we'd always say like five meters apart. But in learn to swim, we won't necessarily say that a non-swimmer or beginner needs five meters to, to, to distance themselves before they're going to catch up. So if you said you had a two meter social distancing zone, and you add to that a buffer zone. And again, this could be between one meter, to three meter, depending upon the speed and the ability of the children. But when you start adding that together and you work in a circuit, you could potentially have between eight to 10 pupils, again, depending on whether you, you have sort of a, a four meter or three meter or, or um, two meter distance between each pupil. But by having those markers there, one, the pupils are closest to the wall for three quarters of their swim. Second to that, that's probably easier for you as a teacher to be managing that area or with an assistant to be managing that area if you've got one. Third to that, eight to 10 pupils is a lot closer to what we might normally operate rather than looking at five pupils, which again, from a viability point of view, would work. And again, you could even, when you look at just the two meter, you could go to 12 in this space, but I thought 12 isn't, isn't potentially realistic. Eight to 10 is somewhere between. So hopefully that just shows by changing the way we set the kids off. And again, it might not be normal for us to set the kids off in a circuit. And again, it might not be that they're all doing a full circuit before we stop them and give them teaching points. But again, there's a clear reference point of, of where that pupil would stop. Because again, there'd be a marker on the side, it might be a cone, it might be a float, anything. It could be a toy and even on the lane rope. And at least that way, again, it's something visual, the pupils can understand it and hopefully makes it easier to manage that process. Yes. Kids might catch each other up. Yes, kids might not understand how to maybe stop and overtake, but these are all things that we need to educate the pupils about. Next one, please, uh, Brett, and hopefully the next picture comes up. So again, all of those, oh, back a second, back a second. Perfect, so all that works, but with kids that can already swim, I recognize with a non-swimmer, not gonna work, even with beginners, it's not gonna work. So coming back to how could it work with that sort of parent and child bubble? Now, if you specialize just in adult and child um, lessons, I, I don't really see there being an issue with that coming back. It's quite low risk. It's more about maybe parents' perception of, again, the particular age groups, whether it, they would feel happy bringing maybe a three month old or, or younger um, into the, the pool environment, which again, um, it's just a, a, every parents can have their, their own fears and worries and preferences. But when we start looking at sort of the non-summers and this idea of maybe the five to seven year olds having a parent or a guardian in the water with them, like Dave said, they can still have that, that two meter sort of bubble around them. We don't need to look at sort of increasing the amount of space they need as long as those two stay with each other. Again, if we're looking at sort of the supporting them and maybe holding the floats, holding the woggle, giving them encouragement and also making sure that they don't all swim on top of each other. I really do see that being a, a, a viable way of a, an interim measure. Again, in this example, we've had to use the whole teaching pool to, to be able to do that. And again, you might not be able to fit as many people in. But in this option three, I've just looked at, well, again, if we've got 36 meters and that's the perimeter around the pool, 
I would look at the perimeter if you're looking at sort of that circuit rather than the meter squared, because the meter squared assumes that everybody's going to be stood still, whereas the perimeter would assume they're all going to be swimming around in that same direction. Again, if we apply the, the two meter rule, which would just assume that everybody's going to be two meters distance um, apart, swimming around the edge of the pool, you could fit 18 pupils in. Not probably going to be viable because they're not going to have that buffer zone. But if you said a four meter, that means you'd have nine pupils or sort of nine pairs uh, within that space. I put eight in the diagram because, again, I think that's more realistic. This buffer zone, that idea, again, it's something I want everybody to sort of explore. It's something that came to us at 10 o'clock last night um, whilst we were writing everything on the whiteboard. But it's something, again, I think will help in terms of, of managing that space. Again, if you're looking at your adult and child lessons and, again, doing particular skills such as flotation or aquatic breathing, um, or even just regaining feet. Again, the reason I put two of the, the pairs in the middle is just to show that, again, you could have positions in the middle of the water where, in an adult and child lesson, you're doing particular holds or particular songs, whereas you might normally do it as a, as a close circle or you do, might do mat activities together. Those sort of things are, are potentially going to be possible, but we could still do something that's adapted to that as long as, again, everybody knows where they need to be within the pool side position. I think all of this works when there's a clear visual um, sort of reference point, whether it's on the pool floor, where again, we could look at getting stickers and whether we can find adhesive glue that works to get those stickers on the pool floor. So that when you have those moments, everybody stood still, they all, they all go in those positions, or it's just something as simple on pool side or, or on the lane rope. Either way, think about what would work best, because again, that will make it easier to ensure that we can manage the, the group environment rather than being worried that everybody's going to get too close to each other. Again, that's just some examples. Again, you could have pupils on the side. Again, if that's what you feel is going to be the best way of doing it. But if you are having the pupils on the side, think about that exclusion zone, that zone around pool side of the teacher needs to ensure that they're then social distancing away from those pupils that, that are on the pool side. That could just be that they're on the opposite side to where the pupils are, but it's all these sort of things that we need to consider. Next slide, please, Brett. So just to sum up some of this stuff, and again, I, there's so many things I could talk about, but I'm just conscious of time. Um, think about the pupils having that lessons for a long time. We're going to have to reteach the basics. Don't think of it that we're maybe going back to lessons as they were pre-lockdown. We're going to have to make sort of a hybrid that's going to be very, very different to ensure that one, the staff are safe, and two, we're, we're keeping the pupils safe. We know we need to educate the pupils about social distancing. And like Dave said, think about how we can do that prior to them coming to the pool. Your lessons are going to need to focus more on sort of the confidence building. But a big thing I think that a lot of pupils, because again, the, 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 the customer information that we've got from adults is that the thing they want to come back and do is things that they can sort of socialize at, at a, a safe dif distance to sort of group classes. I think kids are missing seeing, seeing their friends and especially those that haven't gone back to school yet. So allowing time that they can socialise by a socially acceptable two metre distance, doing games and things where they feel like actually they can interact with other pupils, I think will be a real important part of our lessons, not just teaching them the, the strokes and the skills. And again, really going back to the basics of, right, teaching flotation, teaching aquatic breathing and making sure that, that the, they, they know how to do this and not assuming that they'll remember. We've already said not all lessons may be feasible to return, especially I think those that are that, working with children with disabilities, if it can't be done from the side, and again, we don't feel it's, it's your risk assessment can, can both protect the pupil and the teacher. If manual handling is required, then again, I'd be advising for those lessons, don't start them yet, look, look to delay that uh, until we've got more guidance on, on what that looks like moving forward. Engaging with your staff is going to be key to all this. It, again, as I always said, staff are going to be nervous coming back. Not all staff might want to come back. So again, it's all these considerations to take into account. And training on, on those staff from a COVID perspective on how they actually teach is going to be a huge part of that. And again, we'll talk about briefly um, what STA are going to be doing to, to help um, your teaching workforce. So next slide, please, Brett. So last bits, guys, and we're trying to finish on a positive um, in terms of opportunities. Um, it's I, I know Dave's laughing there, but it is that all this is, is I'm trying to put sort of a, a, um, 
a positive spin on all this. It is, it is a, a really rubbish time for all of us. None of us want our pores closed. None of us want to be in this position. But how could we have used this lockdown or continue to use what position we're in to, to think about what we're going to do sort of wider? Um, I wish I could credit the person that put this on, on the Swim Teacher Network, and this was sort of in April, but they were mentioning about um, basically see this as what do you want to change? And it really sort of spoke to me because, again, every business should be looking at, well, what do they want to change and, and do, do things that they've not maybe had the chance to do? So my question to all of you are, during the shutdown period, have you reviewed what changes you want to make to your business? And that could be small, big, anything. But again, yes, no, or, or not thought about it. Um, but again, it'd be interesting to see what um, people are saying. And again, there's a huge difference. That's good to see. So kind of 80% plus saying yes, brilliant. Um, so I think I'm, I'm talking to, to, to those that are converted to, which is great. So can stop the poll there, please, Brett. So yeah, eight six percent said yes. Amazing. I think again, if you've thought about these things, all we're going to be looking at now is just again trying to contextualise some of the things that you could think about in terms of how you want to change um, how you operate as a, as a swim school business. So next slide, please, Brett. So all I tried to split it down into is that as, as a swim school business, if I'm a swim school business at the moment, I'd be looking at sort of the, these four areas. Can you look at efficiencies you could make? diversifying your business to ensure that it can it could potentially um, sort of uh, withstand any other sort of changing factors that come into play and again can we adapt to the situation we're currently in and look at growth sort of longer term in terms of efficiency again every business is having to look at how they're cutting costs and again things like sort of finances payroll your booking systems your pupil enrollment again anything that's quite manual can you make that digital to, to save a cost there Ultimately, your staffing cost is probably going to be the biggest area and none of us would like to talk about the, that reality. But when you see people like um, British Gas looking at uh, the matter of done a in Lake, I think every business has to look at what uh, what is the amount of staff we actually need. And it's not a nice thing to, to have to, to review, but it's a reality of, of necessarily owning that business. Diversifying it. What is your USP? What is it that makes you different? Again, if your USP is that you're teaching the water, well, that might not be a USP right now. What is your USP that you can adapt to, to make sort of um, your business sort of stand out from others. Are there any transferable skills that you could take from the pool to elsewhere? Is it actually your business could could diversify into other areas? Again, not saying we all don't want to leave being swimming, uh, teaching swimming, but is it that it's an interim sort of measure to ensure that your business can survive? What training development can you do to ensure that your staff are, 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 are skilled to be able to adapt to different roles on different days? And again, are there other markets you could expand in? In terms of adapting your business, you need to be flexible to your customers. If you've got customers that are not wanting to come back, again, is there a way that you can make sure you save their space for maybe September, or that if they're on a direct debit, you could keep them frozen so they don't actually then end up losing them. The key thing for all of us is to retain our current customers so that, again, if we've got 50% that want to come back, great, can we offer them um, a particular service? But for that 44% that potentially don't want to come back, how can we ensure that we still keep them? Because we know it's, it's easier to retain a customer and, and cheaper to retain them than it is then to potentially have to replace that in the future. Again, deliver what's sustainable. Don't try and do too much. Do as much as you can. And again, don't feel pressured to rush back if you're not ready and you don't feel your business is, is at that position. We've already said about sort of the, the, the alternative to lessons. Again, family lessons. We may have never looked at family lessons before, but families are going to want things to do. Everybody's going crazy, stuck inside, but can you offer an activity which is safe, which again, it, it might be a, an adapted lesson, not what we'd normally do, but it's something that again could uh, generate revenue uh, for you as a swim school. The sort of parent and child looking at more key stage one, sort of the, the five to seven year olds, and again, looking at how we can accommodate that. And even looking at sort of fitness swimming in classes, if it's something you've never done before, but you have your own facility or, or space to be able to do something, think about whether you could operate that, um, again, as, as, as an interim um, measure to create some income. The key thing with all this is don't use this opportunity of lockdown. Um, don't waste it because we're not going to get another one again. We're not going to get a chance to change everything if you want to make yeah. those changes. Say again, Dave. I said we hope. We're not going to get this. <laughs> we hope, we hope. Fingers crossed. We hope. Again, same positive. 
hopefully we don't end up um, having to, to lock down again. But it, it, where do you want your business to be? What is your business plan? And how could you make some short term changes that, again, we maybe don't want to make, but then lead to those long term goals that you've got? There's no point, point in something in place that you're constantly going to have to change to get to where you want to be. Think about what you want to do that's going to lead you there and it will be a much more efficient process of doing so. So next slide, I think, second to last. So the start reality is that the profitability of running lessons in a COVID secure environment is going to be very tight. And again, everybody's got to think about whether they, they are going to be able to do it and, and be sustainable in, in running those lessons. Is your business prepared both running the short term and what you want to achieve long term? Again, just because things have changed now doesn't mean your long term goals for your business have to be put to the sidelines. Think about how you can still get there. And again, it helps you have that clear drive and determination to get through this very difficult time. It is the time to make those changes. And again, there might not be comfortable changes, but if it helps you to get to that point, then I see them as a necessity. It's really not going to be easy for any of us. I must stress just because, again, I work for the biggest operator of pools in the country we're going to find it just as difficult as, as a small swim school. Yes, we've got bigger facilities. Yes, um, we've, we, we're in a very different position. But again, it's, it's not going to be easy for, for anybody operating swimming lessons um, moving forward. But think about the, the benefits those changes are going to make long term. Think about the long term goal to, to really sort of keep this positive mind frame. Because again, I know it can be very hard sometimes seeing all of the guidance and seeing it quite negative. Try and see the positive in it, because again, none of us want to be in this position. All of us are trying to do the best to get back to some element of normality. We've just got to do it in the most safe way for, for our staff and for our customers. So the last slide, please, Brett. Or second to last. Yeah, the second to last. So staff training, um, I just really, this is just us telling you that the SGA are here to help. We're here to help you as much as we can. Um, please do bear in mind it's very, very, very difficult for us to give to give specific guidance for every swim school out there. There's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of you, thousands of you out there, um, and it's really hard for us to give you one definitive answer. So all we can do is interpret the guidance from the government um, and do the best we can with it. We do want to hear from you. We are hearing from lots of you, um, but we want to hear from you in terms of what training do you want? What help do you want? It's all right us putting on webinars like this and lots of other things, but we need to know what you want. So some of the things we are developing, um, we're going to be doing one on effective teaching from the pool side, which obviously various other organisations have done as well. But we will be looking at that. We'll be talking about another one, how to teach non-swimmers and beginners from the pool side, um, specifically non-swimmers and beginners. We're, we're going to look at creating fun lessons whilst still maintaining social distancing. And then any other ideas you've got, please put them in the comments. Um, and we will do as much of this as we can. Um, but just bear in mind, it's 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 very, very hard to say at your pool, you could do this because we don't know your pool necessarily. Um, so try and take all of the guidance that you've read and just work with that as best you can. If you've got specific questions, obviously you can ask us. We're always here for you. OK, thank you, Brett. Next slide. Um, Here's the one that's not quite so cheery, but could be, depending on how you want to look at it. And I'm going to look at it on a positive. Um, the lots of you have written in the questions as I've been scrolling through while Andrew was talking. Everyone keeps saying, so when can we reopen? What's the date? When are we allowed to? Can we open now? The, the government currently have said that all swimming pools must remain closed. That's it. So all pools, that includes rightly or wrongly, and I, I understand I've had an awful lot of queries and comments about, yeah, but I've got an outdoor pool. I've got a private pool. I've got a uh, an endless pool in a private facility. And I, I get that, but it's not us. People people shouting at me saying I should open their, I should let them open their pool. It's not us. It's the government have said pools cannot open. The only exception to that is certain pools are allowed to open currently for elite training only. And the government define what that is. Um, so that's the only exception. We're waiting for the green light. Government haven't formally announced anything about formally al or, or allowing commercial pools to open. Um, guidance has been released from us. It's been released from Swim England. It's been released from RLSS in preparation for it. And that was at the request of the, the various government bodies, Sport England, etc. Um, it's 
we're waiting the same as you are for a date. We're as desperate to open as you are. Um, and just bear in mind that all of the different countries, I'm not sure exactly who we've got on, the, on right now, but depending on what country you're on may depend on when you open. So Wales, for example, I know aren't looking at opening as far as I'm aware until September anyway. Um, the latest thing, if you are, if you're on the Teachers Network or you follow me on Facebook, you'll have seen this morning that I've just posted an ITV notification um, that are saying that the government are due, apparently, to announce specifically about swimming pools on Thursday. So all tune in on Thursday to Boris's announcement. Um, the the what we the best guess that we know at the moment, what we've been told at the moment, is the fourth of July is the date, the earliest date they're looking to reopen. But they're going to specifically address it on Thursday, so let's wait and see and pray. Well, that's it from us, I think. Andrew, got anything to add? No, that's that's it. Um, in terms of the questions that everybody's putting on here, guys, um, I will see if um, Rav and Brett can get some of those. If there are any um, specific technical queries, um, I'll try and type some answers out and we can get back to people or we can do an FAQ that we post and um, for any of the ones we've not been able to answer. Um, but yeah, um, nothing else from me. So we're, we're going to hand to Rav just to ask us a couple of the sort of more burning questions. Um, so Rav, fire away. Hi guys, uh, a couple of reoccurring questions if I just go through a couple. Um, so the first one is, does the Swim England override SBA, as in do the Swimming Teachers Association go by Swim England guidance? Uh, the, the short answer is no. No, no, we don't, and no, they don't. So, no, we we are an NGB in our own right. They're an NGB that's funded by Sport England. We're an NGB that is self-funded. Um, so, no, is the answer to that question in short, simple terms. We we can do our own thing with our own members and our own swim school. Thanks, Dave. I'll do one more question because I know we're we're quite tight on time. Um, so, one question that has been going around us from a teachers network. If teachers are to teach beginners from poolside and have parents in the water to support beginner swimmers, do they need a separate qualification for teaching parent and child classes as now the teacher is teaching through the parent or can a level two te qualified teacher teach with parents in the water? I think, yeah, I clarified this earlier, it, they wouldn't need a separate qualification. When we talk about a baby and a toddler lesson, that's more about ensuring that somebody is qualified to teach that particular group of pupils. Again, if you've got a, a five to seven year old with a parent in the water, you would normally teach that five, seven year old. You're going to teach them the same activities. So as a qualified award or certificate or, or some England level two, you are qualified. Just see the parent as the assistant. Yes, it's different, but everybody is qualified on, on all three of those qualifications to use an assistant teacher. In this sort of adaptation, the assistant becomes the parent or the guardian. It's more about maybe uh, individual CPD trainers to talk about that. And again, as part of one of the CPDs that Dave mentioned, that's what we'll start to look at is, again, teaching non summer beginners from poolside, how do we utilise the parent and how would we ensure that the teachers feel comfortable giving instructions to both the children and to the parent? Again, it's just trying to adapt what we would normally do. Right, fab. Thanks, guys. I think um, we'll leave it there. And then, as Andrew said, we will send across the FAQs to everyone um, after this session. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks, Rav. Thank you, thank you Dave. Thank you, Rav. And uh, thank you all for calling in and, and or being on here. And if you um, if you have any questions, obviously keep sticking them in the box, and then we'll um, we'll try and answer as many as we possibly can for you. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone.